discussion on the ear. And now we're going to take a look at how the ear is tied to balance and equilibrium as opposed to looking at how it was tied to the sense of hearing. So as we come back to the ear itself, we take a look once again at the anatomy, recognizing again that the uh, outer ear and the middle ear are associated only with the sense of hearing. It's not until we get to the inner ear here that we finally find the structures that are dedicated to balance and position. The cochlea, way down here, uh, with the cochlear nerve uh, streaming from it, those were going to be dedicated once again to the sense of hearing. And so as we begin to look up in the top part here of the ear uh, with the vestibule and the semicircular canals, that's where we see the organs that are associated with balance and position. So keep in mind again, the vestibule is considered bony labyrinth, again, filled with parts of membranous labyrinth as well as perilymph. And the two membranous uh, labyrinth components within the vestibule are the saccule and the utricle. So in this image right down here, this all represents the vestibule, right, bony labyrinth. And within it, you see down here uh, the saccule sitting towards the base near the snail, right? So it's the snail's head if the cochlea is the snail shell. And the utricle right up here, which is closer to those semicircular canals. So when, uh, right there, those are both associated with balance and position. Now, just like we saw within the cochlea, there's going to be a specialized receptor that's there. Within the utricle and the saccule, there's receptors that are referred to as maculae, right? Macula would be singular, and they designate those right here with those little purple discs. So it's representing one um, maculae, right? So the cluster of maculae right here and the saccule cluster of maculae here within the utricle. Now, both of the maculae are responsible for monitoring what's called static equilibrium. So this is linear acceleration, right? So this is up and down and forwards and backwards and side to side, straight line changes. Um, and again, we're looking at acceleration. So if you go from being still to moving slowly and then moving quickly, um, these receptors actually uh, adapt pretty quickly so that they can monitor the rate of change. When you look specifically at the saccule, right, the maculae that are within there are referred to as maculae sacculi. Right? So right in here, those are responding to vertical movements. So if you are jumping up and down, right, or if you're in an elevator and you go up and you go down, um, or if you bend down to pick something up and stand up, that's what the maculae right there are going to be responding to. When you look at the macula utriculi, that's acceleration in the horizontal plane. Right? So when you are walking forwards or walking backwards or even walking side to side, that's when you're going to be triggering those receptors. So very, very specific, again, and what kind of stimuli they can monitor. Um, we do also know that changes in head position can be monitored by the utricle. So if you tilt your head to the side or if you tilt it to the front, um, you're going to start to see the, the maculae within the utricle respond to that. So essentially what happens here Let's go to this direction. If you take a close-up look at what these macula look like, they actually very closely resemble the structure on a microscopic level of what you saw within the scala media of the ear. Right? So to begin with, right down here, you're going to have a nice thick membrane Right, which is going to embed a number of types of cells, many supporting cells that are structural, and then look at that, more hair cells. Right? So again, these hair cells are going to have tiny hairs that come out of the top. You'll notice that some of them are na named what's called a canicillium or a stereocilium. We're not going to talk about the difference between those two, but they functionally are pretty significant for your ability to monitor position. We're just not going to get into detail there. And just like you saw with those hair, uh, the hair of the hair cells within the, the cochlea, these tiny stereocilia and kinocilia are going to be embedded in another mucousy membrane. Now this is called the otolith membrane, and that's because embedded in it are these calcium rocks called otoliths, right? So rocks within the ear, right, or bodies within the ear. Um, and essentially these create a weight, right, and a position um, by which you dictate the sensitivity of these hairs, right, as they embed into that membrane. Um, what's interesting is that they've They've uh, discovered that as the odorless change position, that changes your sensitivity and in some cases can create sensations of vertigo. And so head positioning with uh, occupational therapy is actually a pretty big thing where you try to roll those odorless back into place so that these hairs can position. So again, that's where we're looking at uh, the saccule and the utricle, looking at uh, linear acceleration.
Now, as we move to the semicircular canals, uh, we take a look at the, the ducts that are within those. So again, the ducts are going to be surrounded by paralymph, and they themselves are filled with endolymph, very similar to what we saw within the cochlea. Um, and one of the structures you learned about in lab is called an ampulla. Now remember, so if this is your duct right here, the ampulla is the swelling at the base. It's still considered part of the membranous labyrinth. And so the ampulla there is that swelling, which essentially connects the semicircular ducts to the vestibule, right? Specifically the utricle right there. And of course, all of this is filled with endolymph. And it can all circulate and move as you begin to move in the specific ways we're going to talk about. And that fluid can pass, you know, right here past the ampulla. Now, kind of like you saw maculae right here within the utricle and the saccule, you see a very specific kind of a receptor grouping in the ampulla. And these are called the Christi ampullaries. Right? And these Christi ampullaries, right, or Christa would be singular, are monitoring dynamic equilibrium. So not static and linear forces anymore, right? Now we're looking at things that are angular, right? So very specifically, rotation. Um, and so the idea right here is that just like we would see within the cochlea, just like we would see in the vestibule, you do actually pick up on changes in movement using this very specific receptor and you send those signals along a nerve, right? In this case, it's still the vestibular nerve, just like you would have seen right here, fibers of the vestibular nerve within the maculae. Um, and that's going to be sending signals to the brain. We'll look at that pathway here in just a second. Uh, but if we begin to focus on these Christi right through here, I want to show you the structure. So again, really similar to what we've seen in the vestibule as well as in the cochlea. Here are all of your supporting cells, right? And then you reach a number of hair cells. Each of the hair cells having fibers of the vestibular nerve wrapped around their bases. And out of the hair cells, you have hairs. Right? So once again, we see kinocilia and stereocilia. I'm not going to ask you about the difference between the two. But those hairs, just like in the other examples, are embedded right here in this mucus-like membrane. So like we said, fluid is going to be passing back and forth. Right? The endolymph is passing back and forth to the semicircular ducts. It's going to pass across this entire structure here uh, in initiating movement. So since we know that this is specific for rotational movement, this illustration does a nice job of helping you understand what happens. So if somebody is at rest, right, no rotational movement is taking place, then there's no movement of fluid here through the semicircular ducts or inside the ampulla. And so the hair, right, with its little mucus-like uh, cupula is standing straight upright. Now as you begin to rotate, and this lady is rotating to the left, we find that the endolymph initially begins to flow in the opposing direction. And so the endolymph begins to pass over the cupula, bending it in this direction. And that be causes those uh, hair cells to begin to depolarize, sending signals along uh, the vestibular fibers to the brain. Now as you begin to slow down, the fluid actually changes direction, and that's because of the shape of these ducts. Um, but it would slow down, and it would cause the cupula to now bend the opposite direction. And so you begin to change which cells are depolarizing, and you begin to change the frequency at which they do that. So once again, you're sending a lot of really specific signals to the brain. You've sped up with rotation here, and now the brain also becomes aware that you're slowing down. And so as those signals are passing through, right, they join into that vestibulocochlear nerve and take a look at all the different places these signals need to go. To begin with, we've got signals here that are running to the cerebellum. Since the cerebellum was so important in monitoring balance, you've got to send signals here from the vestibule and from the semicircular ducts all the way to the cerebellum so that motor coordination occurs in an appropriate manner. You also have body position signals right there being sent to uh, the brainstem, specifically to the reticular formation, right? making you aware of things like somatic motor control, right? getting ready for those types of movements, as well as keeping you alert. Right? So nothing's going to keep you more alert than being spun around or moved around uh, when you're trying to relax. And then, of course, if we're just looking for spatial awareness, you can see those signals traveling to the thalamus and then here to your vestibular cortex uh, within the cerebrum so that you, you know, you're registering um, what parts of the body are moving as well as in which directions. So that gives you just your basic awareness while the cerebellum is taking that information in a subconscious way to help you generate your next movements.
So it's pretty complicated, but what's neat here is you finally get to see how this correlates with all the different structures we've been talking about. So the big thing is just to make sure you know which receptors are found within the macule, I'm sorry, within the utricle and the saccule, and then which receptors are going to be found in those ampulla and how they're different in the types of movements that they monitor.